Hello and welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily. I'm Aaron Porras, and coming up in today's newscast, Iranian President Raisi, a.k.a. the Butcher of Tehran, denying the Holocaust in the latest episode of CBS's 60 Minutes. Meanwhile, Israeli archaeologists stumble upon an incredibly rare and ancient burial cave. And later, the latest in Israeli travel and tourism from the floor of the annual Passport News Gala. Incendiary comments on CBS News' famous 60 Minutes as Iran's President Raisi denying the Holocaust and rejecting Israel's right to exist. Do you believe the Holocaust happened? That six million Jews were slaughtered? Look, historical events should be investigated by researchers and historians. There are some signs that it happened. If so, they should allow it to be investigated and researched. Iran's President Ibrahim Raisi denying the Holocaust last week, saying there are some signs, but more investigation is needed. Israeli Prime Minister Yair Lapid meantime responding by tweeting harrowing pictures from the Nazi massacre and captioning the tweet as, quote, some signs. In any case, Raisi's incendiary comments appearing during the latest episode of 60 Minutes, in which Raisi, colloquially known as the Butcher of Tehran for his brutal murder of over 30,000 dissidents, pressed on a number of issues. Interviewer Leslie Stahl focusing on Iran's imprisonment of American citizens, Western sanctions, and Tehran's nuclear ambitions. For example, the expose reminding that only 1% of Iran's energy needs are generated by nuclear power, as opposed to Iran's statements. The Islamic Republic of Iran has said many times that possessing nuclear weapons has no place in our doctrine. However, the U.S. intelligence community has assessed with high confidence that Iran did attempt to develop a nuclear bomb in the past. Additionally, as with the Holocaust denial, Stahl questioning Raisi's anti-Semitic beliefs, the president saying that Israel has no right to exist and that every Arab state that is normalized with Israel through the Abraham Accords is stabbing the Palestinians in the back. Following up with his response, then Prime Minister Yair Lapid turning his attentions to the United Nations, where Raisi is set to address the General Assembly in New York. Lapid calling on the UN not to platform the so-called butcher of Tehran's hateful rhetoric on the global stage. Now, with more on Iran's President Raisi, as well as other recent events, fellow at the International Institute for Counterterrorism at Reichman University, Dr. Fadi Ismail. Fadi, it's great to have you back with us, as always. So, starting with Raisi's Holocaust denial, do you think he really doesn't believe that the Holocaust happened, or is, this more a, is his denial more of a political move in order to somehow justify anti-Israel sentiments? You know, I've been hearing this for uh, all these kinds of comments for about three decades right now. And uh, at this point, I don't even know, because there are such... Uh, we assume that everybody studies about the Holocaust. We assume that everybody is taught the facts. We assume that everybody knows what we know. I've, the first time I have seen a video, uh, like an actual film about the Holocaust, that was, I think, fourth or fifth grade. Uh, with, we saw all the atrocities. We assume that everybody in the world uh, gets that kind of education. Apparently, many don't. Actually, way too many don't. So either it is uh, some kind of uh, ignorance. I don't know. But what I can tell you for sure, it is willful ignorance. Because once you grow up, there are so many opportunities to learn, to know, to study, to uh, develop. And the Holocaust is ever present in everything in modern uh, culture. So somebody like Raisi, who is not, uh, uh, he is an, uh, a very educated person. He read many books in his life. In his life, he knows a lot about history. Uh, I find it hard to believe that it is not some kind of a willful acceptance of conspiracy theories and of all forms of either Holocaust denial or Holocaust minimizing. I mean, there's also this trend that is in the middle. It is not really a denial as such, but it is also an attempt to 
to dilute the meaning, both right. the dimensions and the meaning, the significance of this, uh, his, as he said, historical event, as if it's an event, uh, not understanding it is actually the culmination of 2,000 years worth of, of propaganda and, and hateful uh, uh, history. So uh, whether it is flat out denial or whether it is an attempt to dilute the importance, uh, of course, there's a political dimension sure. to it because the Holocaust uh, in the end is also a political player in a sense because it, it serves as, as uh, an argument, if you will, or um, to lack of a better word, a backdrop to right. many uh, um, uh, historical claims by Israel and the Zionist movement. All right, well, Prime Minister Yair Lapid responded to Raisi's 60 Minutes interview in part by calling on the United Nations not to provide Raisi a platform for, you know, quote, the butcher's lies. Should 60 Minutes have given him a platform to begin with, or do you think that the interview was fair? The interview was, in terms of, well, these are not opposites. The interview was fair in the sense that he had the chance to speak, to say whatever he thinks. And Leslie gave him all the opportunities. And that says it was fair in that sense. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of, I have an attitude that is all about freedom of speech. And let's uh, uh, look at every argument so that we can uh, 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 face it, that we can confront it head on. Some people disagree with that, and I can see why. Some people say, no, we have to put limits to freedom of expression. I come from a school of thought, an American school of thought, that says, let anybody, um, you know, make a fool out of themselves, and we are ready to confront and, and, uh, and respond. But I, I can see the counter-argument that says, you know what, some people might take such nonsense and actually believe it. So that is that danger. Um, my, my heart is all on the side of freedom of expression. All right, well, now, now, the interview also called attention, of course, to his history as the butcher of Tehran and, and more recently, the murder of Masa Amini, uh, a woman who was beaten to death by Iranian morality police last week for not wearing her hijab properly. Uh, in the wake of her death, large popular protests have, have popped up calling for death to the dictator Khamenei, and women have been posting videos of themselves, of course, cutting their hair and refusing to wear the hijab altogether. How would you characterize the, the atmosphere in the streets of Iran right now and local support for the regime? Look, my colleagues that are busy following uh, the information coming from the streets of, of Iran in general, it's not only Tehran, by the way, uh, we hear things going all the way to the peripheral uh, parts of the country. Look, uh, the young generation, and I would say the not so young generation, is fed up with this so called morality police. Uh, nobody can police somebody else's morality. People have to make their own choices, definitely not what they wear and how they cover their hair and, stuff and things like that. Um, but what I am worried about is that the lack of support from the West. We need support from the West for these, uh, for these wonderful young people who risk their lives. Who, going out on the street and calling for, you say, the death of Khamenei. Well, he's going to give them their wish very soon. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, we. Uh, my question is, where are we in the West? What, what right. are we doing for these guys? For these well, guys? And I'm very scared because I'm, I remember the Green Revolution and what happened with mm. it. So. All right. Dr. Fadi Ismail, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Have a great day. Now, in other news, Israeli Prime Minister Yair Lapid heading to New York for the UN General Assembly. And while there, he'll address the assembly and he'll meet with a number of foreign leaders. With me to discuss is former Israeli Ambassador Dani Ayalon. Dani, thank you so much for being with us. Now, Lapid, My pleasure. Lapid set uh, uh, to meet on the sidelines with Turkish President Erdogan for the first such meeting between Erdogan and Israeli Prime Minister since 2008. What do you expect the, the primary topics for discussion will be behind closed doors? Well, first of all, I think it's a very good uh, development which builds on the uh, rapprochement between Turkey and Israel for the last few months. Uh, we have to remember that um, in, in, this, uh, in, in this, this time, Turkey uh, comes from uh, weakness. They need Israel for a few things. First of all, as a bridge to the United States and to Washington, D.C., um, they need friends in Congress. Uh, President Biden would not stick uh, to Erdogan. And secondly, they need and they covet our uh, gas in the Mediterranean. They would love our ga this gas to be uh, flown into um, Europe 
through Turkey and not through uh, Greece, as it is planned now. now. Uh, so, so this pretty much is the background. Uh, for the meeting itself, I believe what Israel would expect right away, or this is the first, uh, um, let's say, uh, thing after the, uh, the, the meeting is the return of the ambassadors. And the, this has been already uh, um, agreed. And now it's a matter, I think, of uh, weeks where exchange of ambassadors will be seen. All right, so Lapid is also set to speak with the Greek Prime Minister Mitsotakis, uh, UN Secretary General Guterres, and the new British Prime Minister Liz Truss. What do sideline discussions like these usually consist of? How much meat, so to speak, is there? Or is it mostly niceties and, and photo ops and procedure? No, actually, the entire um, episode of the UN General Assembly is just uh, niceties. It's not a very important event. It's just a place to see and to be seen. Uh, empty words, uh, slogans in the General Assembly, no resolutions that, um, you know, worth even the papers that uh, they are printed on. So it is only important for those uh, sideline uh, meetings. And quite a few things can be um, discussed over there. Uh, first and foremost for Israel would be, of course, to, uh, um, you know, uh, shore up the um, coalition against uh, Iran. And, uh, of course, other bilateral things. So when uh, you meet other uh, um, uh, heads of states, it's a real uh, shortcut to uh, get into some um, into motion, some agreements, bilateral agreements that have been decided and not moved so fast. And it's also a show of uh, friendship, uh, alliance. Uh, sometimes even uh, deals can be cut, you know, or commercial uh, uh, agreements and, and many more. All right. Now, before Lapid set off to New York, the Israeli cabinet formalized funding for the Negev Forum. And, and on top of all the economic efforts that are outlined in the Negev Forum, as you suggested, uh, it, it is suggested that the forum is meant to display a united front against Iran. What do you make? What do, what do you make of this? And what do you think Iran makes of it, uh, particularly after President Raisi's recent comments about the Abraham Accords? Yeah, well, uh, Iran is in flagrant uh, violation of all UN, uh, I would say, uh, um, uh, resolutions of the um, of what all the agreements and treaties that they are signatory of. Uh, first and foremost is the NPT, the Non-Proliferation. Uh, I believe every uh, everyone knows it by now. Uh, first and foremost, the United States. Hence, uh, they have um, toughened their position vis-a-vis uh, -vis the um, agreement that was going to be uh, signed. I believe that the longer um, an agreement is not signed or the longer the sanctions persist, um, Iran is in a, in, a worst, uh, in a worst place. Also, I think what I would advise um, all the countries in the world, but first and foremost the United States, not only to uh, continue the sanctions as they are, but to toughen them up. And mm. they, can, they have a lot of degrees to toughen it up, look at Russia. All right. Uh, Ambassador, Le uh, Ambassador Ayalon, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. Moving on, an ancient burial cave dating back some 3,300 years ago to the time of Pharaoh Ramses II, recently discovered in the Palmachim National Park near Tel Aviv. ITV's Kayla Everlin with the story. <laughs> בחוף פלמחים, עבודות של פטישון, נפער פתח של מערה, מהתקרה. אנחנו ירדנו למטה, ומה שנתגלה בפנינו זה הממצא המדהים הזה. כמות גדולה מאוד של כלים תמימים. יש פה גם עצמות בקערות. אנחנו נדע כמובן לאפיין את הכל. During routine architectural work in Palmachim Park near Tel Aviv, a fallen rock revealing a vast array of artifacts from the late Bronze Age, including pottery, vessels with offerings, cooking pots, lamps, weapons, and other ceremonial works, dating back to the period of Egyptian rule in the area under Pharaoh Ramesses II, the same pharaoh who is thought to be named in the story of the Jewish Exodus some 3,300 years ago. And everything in the cave laid out exactly as they were arranged during what appears to have been burial ceremony. Additionally, the space itself impeccably hewn from stone into a cubic form with a central supporting pillar. 
Dr. David Gilman from the Israel Antiquities Authority saying it's a once in a lifetime find. Uh, burial caves are rare as it is, and finding one that hasn't been touched since it was first used 3,300 years ago is something you rarely ever find. It feels like coming out of an Indiana Jones movie, just going into the ground and everything is just laying there as it was initially. After what seems like a lifetime of no traveling, intensive COVID testing, and just an overall terrible traveling experience, it seems like things are finally getting back to the way that they were. And to celebrate, Emmanuel Kadosh went to check out the annual Passport News Gala to hear from the industry leaders themselves. We are here at the annual Passport News event with some of the most important people in the tourism industry, both Israeli and international. Now, of course, the last couple of years, this event could not be held. So everyone is really excited to be here to talk about the amazing summer that the tourism industry has seen and to have a great night. So let's get going. This Passport News event isn't just a simple party. In fact, it's a People of the Year award show, where they hand out awards to the people who have impacted the tourism and aviation industry to show their appreciation. Passport News is, uh, is the leading uh, trade magazine in the Israeli market. And uh, happily, they're uh, holding this event, uh, which they're holding once a year. Uh, hosting all the uh, airline, travel agents, uh, travel agencies, hotels, you know, like the main event of uh, the social event of the aviation and tourist uh, sector in Israel. Tell me a little bit about this gala that we're here. I know that you guys do this every year, minus the two years of Corona. What is this event? This is a, actually a gala evening that we do every year before the new year of uh, the Jewish people and that we are uh, uh, inviting all the decision makers, the owners of the company, Minister of Tourism will join us in a few minutes, ambassadors, there are almost 30 people from abroad that coming and with a big smile because after the two years this is the minimum that we can do and to, to make all the industry together. No one seemed to have expected the crazy numbers that they saw post-pandemic, giving these leaders just one more reason to come out and celebrate tonight. And who could forget about the main event of the evening, the awards? Among the awards of recognition that were distributed was the person of the year, Leo Raviv, the CEO of the East Hotel Hotel chains, as well as the lifetime achievement in the cruise industry, which was awarded to Uli Schneval, founder of the Sanoma Company, along with many more people and many more awards that shed light on all the amazing efforts these leaders have put into getting things back up and running smoothly. But now, the real question that I want to know is when do these industry leaders predict numbers will go back to quote unquote normal? Our expectation is that uh, at least in Israel we will see the numbers uh, similar to 2019 uh, next year and globally at the beginning of 24. I'm sure we can all agree about how beyond happy to hear that tourism is getting back to normal. It's been a rough couple of years, and I'm sure everyone can agree that a well-deserved trip around the world is just what everyone needs. And how would we do that if not for the impactful people that were here with me tonight? Now, as you likely know, the Rosh Hashanah Jewish New Year's holiday is right around the corner. And to help people of all backgrounds and socioeconomic statuses celebrate properly, the Yad Ezra Vishulamit charity is organizing baskets stocked with everything that a family in Israel might need. Joining me now to discuss is Chief Media and Marketing Officer with Eish HaTorah, Jamie Geller. Jamie, thank you so much for joining us. All right, so we heard that you are at Yad Ezra Vishulamit's center in Jerusalem. What brings you there? Well, for me, the reason I am at Yad Ezra Vishulamit is because you know I built a whole career around food. So any charity that exists that is dedicated to feeding the needy of Israel is something that I want to pay attention to. But specifically, Yad Ezra Vishulamit is dedicated to the children. And as a mother, 
uh, to know that there are almost one million children in Israel, that's one out of three that are below the poverty line, that are going to school with nothing in their bellies, and to know that Yad Ezra Shalimi doesn't just stop with the food, but that continues with school supplies and after school tutoring, there is no greater organization to be associated with and to help raise money than Yad Ezra Shalimi. Can you tell me a little bit more about, uh, about what they do? Okay, so Yad Ezra Veshulami is dedicated to feeding the needy children of Israel, to clothing them, to ensuring that they're healthy. So first and foremost, they do baskets. Once a week, they give out about 10,000 baskets to needy families across Israel. There are 86 distribution centers, and they give baskets for smaller families and larger families. Because really what help is it to give one chicken to a family with 10 kids? So I love that they really pay attention to all the details. In addition, in both Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, and Sfat, they have two educational centers that children can go to after school to get a hot meal, to get tutoring. Uh, they help with school supplies at the beginning of the year, warm winter clothing during the winter. They saw a girl going to school in the middle of winter with sandals, and that was it. Now they have a winter uh, clothing program. So they're always, always giving and thinking about every detail. The founder, Rabbi, he says he's not a rabbi, but we all think he is. Rabbi Aryeh Lori says he cannot go to sleep with knowing that there's a child in Israel that is hungry. Every time a need comes up, he creates a program for it. And that's why I love Yad Ezra Vishulami. So how is this different from other organizations? I think it's important to note, obviously there are a lot of organizations, unbelievable organizations around Israel that are dedicated to feeding the hungry, but there's so many below the poverty line, so many children and so many families. If you put the efforts of all the organizations together, you're not even scratching the surface. What that means is we're not even reaching 25% of Israel's needy. So Yad Ezra Vashulami is the largest and they think not just about clothing, but about baby formula. Like I said about, I've spoken before about the school supplies, the tutoring, a healthy heart, a healthy mind, a healthy development for a child. And that's why it makes Yad Ezra Vashulami so special. And, and again, you know, what, what do they do for Rosh Hashanah specifically? All right, in addition to the 10,000 weekly baskets that Yad Ezra Vishulami gives out across Israel, for Rosh Hashanah, they are giving out 55,000 holiday baskets. Now, what is in the baskets, you might wonder? Exactly what we would want for our family. Chicken, grape juice, produce, honey. Honey is very expensive. So this is a time where even more, when it comes to making the holidays, it's so financially uh, cumbersome that even more people need. And it's a time that we need to reach in to our hearts and to our wallets because no one should have a Rosh Hashanah without a warm meal for their family. So 55,000 baskets, and they can only do it with your help. All right, my last question, how can people get involved? Rev. Aryeh Lori, the founder of Yad Ezra Vishulami, says he cannot sleep at night knowing that there is a hungry child in Israel. These children are our children. This is Israel. It's 2022. It's unimaginable that there's this level of poverty. A million, almost a million children, one out of three. And we need to feel it like Rev. Aryeh feels that he's dedicated his entire life so that these children can be fed. We just need to help him. We just need to give. We need to care like he cares. If you feel the need to give just like I do, then please go ahead and visit yadezra.net slash ILTV. That's yadezra.net slash ILTV. Food baskets for a small family are $120, $150 for a larger family. Anything you give will be so appreciated. There are many other programs that we discussed. Please go and visit yadezra.net slash ILTV to find out more. And of course, if you're in Israel, you can come visit and volunteer and pack food baskets. We desperately, desperately need your help, both in Jerusalem and in Sfat. Jamie, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And now let's take a look at the weather forecast. The forecast is calling for cloudy skies this evening, along with lows averaging 20 degrees Celsius or 68 Fahrenheit. And then tomorrow, partly cloudy skies expected around the country. Uh, with top temperatures reaching a cooler 32 degrees Celsius or 89 Fahrenheit. And that's all for today's news. For more updates from Israel and all of your devices, check out our website, ILTV.tv, and subscribe to our newsletter as well as to our streaming platform, ILTV+. I'm Aaron Porras. Be well, and thank you so much for watching. Hi everyone, 
it's Emmanuel Kadosh. I wanted to invite you all to subscribe to ILTV Plus, where you can find our daily news and updates about Israel. And not only that, but live feeds, entertainment, our kosher food show, and so much more. Needless to say, your subscription to ILTV Plus helps us grow and create more content while also supporting the state of Israel. Our app is available on all platforms and devices, so I'll see you guys there.